okay, I can start this way. I think we'll be, we'll be okay. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Emilio Molina and I work as an R&D engineer at BMAT. And my talk about, will be about MIR research for broadcast monitoring. Um, this presentation uh, is organized as follows. First, I will introduce myself, just to give you some context about who is giving this presentation. Then I will introduce BMAT. Uh, I will describe the technologies we use at BMAT. And then, like, the core of the presentation will be talking about research and about the specific challenges and considerations that we have to take into account when doing research in a company like, like BMAT, right? And finally, I will end with a conclusion. Um, okay, so about myself, uh, well, again, my name is Emilio Molina. Uh, I'm, I've been working in the R&D team of BMAT since 2015. Uh, before that, I did uh, my PhD on MIR, concretely on singing processing at the University of Malaga. Uh, before that, I did uh, the sound and music computing master here at, uh, here at the Pompeu Fabra. And before that, I studied telecommunications and engineering at the University of Malaga. Uh, and about BMAT, uh, well, it, is, it was uh, funded in 2005 as a spin-off of the Universitat Pompeu Fabra. It is based in Barcelona, but it has offices worldwide, mainly for non-technical jobs. Currently, we are around 120 employees, and we are working with more than 100 uh, collective management organizations around the world. Uh, my job here in the R&D team, uh, well, is mainly doing research to improve our current, current technologies and also to create new, new technologies for uh, eventual new customers or services. In the R&D team, we are only four people and we have to do uh, not, only, uh, not only research but also uh, development of the technologies to create a code that is production ready. So the code we implement is running in all our servers. Um, so about what do we do? Um, well, let me describe you like uh, the situation of the music business uh, and how, and I will tell you how BMAT take part in it. So we can imagine an artist, a talented artist that is played uh, a lot in venues, radios, TVs, etc. And on the other hand, we have the collective management organizations. These organizations are responsible for collecting copyrights money, like the royalties from this kind of businesses that are using, are using music to earn money. And uh, they also collect some information about the music that has been played in these businesses. But this information typically is partial, are in many situations there is no information at all, especially when we go to the long tail or, or uh, small b uh, venues, small TVs, small radios. So at the end, with this partial or not ex existing information, the collective management organization have the problem to, uh, to pay the right artist, so they don't really know who they should pay, right? And this is where BMAT take part. At BMAT, uh, we monitor the music that is being played in these kind of uh, businesses in order to report the complete information to the collective management organizations. In this way, we can cover more exhaustively the long tail so that the uh, artists receive exactly what they deserve. That is why our lima is like what plays around comes around. And what technologies do we use to do this monitoring? We use three main technologies. One is audio fingerprinting, music, non-music classification, and cover song identification. Uh, I will describe very quickly these technologies about audio fingerprinting. Uh, I assume you all know what it is. Uh, 
well, is uh, the ability to identify uh, the title of an artist uh, of a song in unknown audio excerpts, taking take it from the from the wild. A fingerprint uh, has to be a summarized representation of the audio, discriminative, fast to process, and uh, very robust to strong audio degradations. There are many ways to compute fingerprints. Uh, some of the most popular are based on uh, spectral peaks on the spectrum, but there are other, other ways like using wavelets, uh, using like binarized representations of the spectrum, and more recently some approaches using deep learning, like kind of embeddings of the, of the audio. And, and the way we use these fingerprints to, to identify is uh, using this architecture. We first build a database of fingerprints by extracting a fingerprint for, uh, from, many, uh, from many songs. And then when we, when we receive an unknown audio excerpt, we apply the same fingerprint structure, and then we apply a matching against the database to know which song it, it, is it, right? Um, this is about audio fingerprinting. The other technology we're using is music detection. Music detection uh, is mainly the problem of sound event detection. We receive an audio stream, and we have to identify uh, audio events of three different classes. is music, or program music, background music, or no music. Uh, well, uh, this is a, actually a classic deep learning problem. Uh, well, this is, this is the problem, is uh, segmenting audio streams in these three classes. And the third technology we work on is cover identification. In this case, unlike audio fingerprinting, uh, we are robust to musical transformations, like different arrangements, different singer, etc. But in this case, the scalability is much harder than in the case of audio fingerprinting. Uh, this is an example of uh, well, one of the state-of-the-art algorithms by Serra in 2008 already. Uh, and it extracts a representation of the audio that well, is more or less robust to this kind of musical transformation that are the HPCPs. It computes own similarity and, and then it says if one against one, uh, it detects if it is a cover or not. So, um, who are the customers and what are the services we provide with these technologies? The customers uh, typically are collective management organizations, but we also work for record labels, publishers, broadcasters, um, and many other kind of, of uh, customers. Uh, and about the services, well, related to fingerprinting is straightforward, it's just monitoring uh, thousands of channels. We are monitoring 24 hour thousands of channels, TVs, radios, and venues. We monitor them against a large catalog, and we provide these reports to the collective management organizations. To the record labels is similar, but they are more interested in their own catalog. Um, in the case of music detection, uh, they want to use it to detect unidentified music so that, so that they can assess more or less uh, our false negatives, and it's a way to know if we are covering all catalog. Uh, it's a extra information to have the, the whole picture. And they also use it to, to know if, if the music is in the foreground on its, or, or in the background, because it might affect the way this specific uh, uh, music should be played. Some, in, in some countries, the music that is being played in the background is paid less than the music that is being paid in the foreground. And about cover identification, uh, we also provide this service, but this is a, uh, um, because of the, the technology itself, uh, actually we provide it with a limitation of catalog. So uh, as soon as we can limit the catalog to some thousands of tracks, well, cover identification is applicable. Uh, and the typical use case is well, uh, in some con concerts or festivals where we know the artists in advance. Uh, some cases where we can have some 
metadata to limit the catalog, like YouTube videos or uh, this is, these are the typical use cases for cover detection, cover identification at DMAT. And now um, I will talk about research, like uh, what are the challenges, the considerations that have to be taken into account when doing research on these technologies at companies like BMAT. Um, I organized this section like in three different points. The first one, is, um, well, is something related to my experience, my, my experience uh, coming from the PhD and doing research at the university and then starting to doing research at a company of the size of BMAT that is not a big company. And well, I learned some things and I, I would like to, to share it with you. So when, when I was at the university, I thought that in companies, uh, ideas and research ideas could be put in production and could have an impact uh, quite easily because you, have, you already have the infrastructure, the customers. And well, I was thinking that uh, that, that could be a thing that is, that is easier than in, at the university. But the reality I found is not always like that. You have to take into account many aspects. Sometimes you have resources or legacy constraints. So maybe the computational cost of your method is too much, or maybe they already have some method that is running there that cannot be stopped, and it's working in a specific way so that your idea doesn't fit there. Sometimes uh, in research, you, you, have to, you cannot forget the real needs of the end users of or the, the company, the needs of the company, even if your idea is beautiful, sometimes it's not the right idea because it doesn't fit the real needs of users. You uh, depend typically on, on other teams. These teams are, are busy. Uh, sometimes they are not so in love with your idea as you, and you have to deal with it and try to be as independent as possible or try to well, to know how to work with them, right? Uh, in the case of BMAT, where everything is applied large scale, for sure you will find unexpected real world scenarios, always. And that is why, in general, your solutions has to have to be very well tested before going to production, because uh, if you don't know the problems of the technologies in, in advance, uh, your customer will be the first person to, to discover them. And that is that might be problematic. And also, even if your idea is good, uh, typically you have to convince someone in, in order to invest on that, uh, in order to allow you to work on that idea. So you have to convince uh, clients, managers, investors, and well, this also requires uh, some skills that is sometimes is not like pure research. Um, I prepared like a, a meme, I don't know if you know this one. Yeah. Uh, well, this is, it is longer, but it's something like how the customer explained what he wanted, right? How the project leader understood it, and how the analyst designed the solution for it. And I also thought that, uh, uh, about what could be the contribution of a researcher. Well, it could have been something like a great, great improvement of the aerodynamics of the swing. Uh, well, it has work and it's hard to do it. But what the customer really wanted might have been this, right? So this is a typical case where, in this case, uh, the researcher forgot the user needs so maybe the kind of evaluation methodology here should have been different. Maybe something like evaluating how happy children are with this swing or uh, how dangerous it is might have been better than spending months on improving the aerodynamics of, of the swing, right? So this is the kind of things that sometimes we can find. Um, and so these kinds of considerations related to BMAT um, applied in the following way. Uh, I mean, in BMAT, uh, we have to take into account several things. 
One is that it does business to business service. So we typically have big clients and none of these big clients should be angry with you because it's a lot of money in general. So you cannot forget about any of your customers. Uh, the clients have access to large auditable reports of results. We allow them to listen to the query and the reference of all matches. So they can assess your quality quite easily. This is also important to take into account. Uh, they have access to all historical results and that makes reproducibility important because you have to be able to explain an issue that happened one year ago. Uh, there is a lot of money that is distributed according to our results. Uh, we estimate that more than 1,000 million euros. So they are very sensitive to changes, even to improvements, because when there is a balance and everyone is receiving a certain amount of money and you improve your system and suddenly someone starts to, to lose money, uh, you have to justify very well that you are improving your system and they will try to find a lot of errors in your new approach. So, uh, well, this is something that has to be taken into account and all changes should be uh, incremental. Different clients are sensitive to different kind of, kind of errors. This is important because sometimes, even if you have a, a general technology, you need different tunings to different customers to make them happy. Uh, we have an ongoing 24-7 service and it cannot be stopped. So the show must go on always and that means that you have a legacy and, and unless you build a totally parallel system that is also super hard to do it, you can now do like, uh, break, uh, like break the system with some uh, new idea. Uh, and again, you have to do incremental improvements on the platform that there is already running. Uh, our system is large scale. We have like millions of identifications per day, hundreds of thousands of hours of phone audio analyzed per day. That means that there is a super high computational impact of algorithm changes. So if you, if you want to improve at 10% the CPU time or the RAM uh, needed for your algorithm, it has to be planned in advance. Well, first you have to know that it will, be ha it will have uh, that impact and then it has to be planned with the IT team to know if it is possible or they have to build more servers, etc. And finally, we work on many different contexts, uh, radio, TVs, venues, digital platforms. That is technologically changing and generalization of your algorithms typically is hard. Sometimes you might have some statistics and some accuracy results in one scenario, but then you go to a different scenario and that might change a lot. So it's hard to generalize. Um, and then now I would like to talk about specific challenges and considerations that have to be taken into account when doing research in these three specific technologies that I, I presented. Um, related to audio fingerprinting, well, we ha one of the lessons learned here is that it's not only a music information retrieval problem, this is like part of the problem because the matching of audio fingerprint is a computational problem, it actually could be better solved by uh, researchers on the field of high performance computing is how to uh, how to improve as much as possible the performance of your method with with computers and this is important in this specific technology because in the case of audio fingerprinting in general you can improve your accuracy with more computation uh, is one of the ways to, to improve your accuracy. So you can improve accuracy in two different ways. One is with MIR ideas to improve the acoustic fingerprint itself, to make it more robust to certain degradation, etc. But also with high performance computing ideas about the way the matching is computed. So uh, it's someone that really knows how to optimize algorithms uh, 
uh, optimizes your, uh, yours, maybe you could have a, a 10x uh, optimization gain, and that might allow you to use uh, denser fingerprints uh, or any kind of uh, matching ideas that are more complicated. So our experience is that apart from research, the specific implementation really matters in terms of audio fingerprinting for improving cost and accuracy. And this is one of the challenges we have, like improving these algorithms, the implementation itself. Uh, about like some challenges related to the service itself. Well, it is in audio fingerprinting is challenging to be robust uh, against mix of degradations. So I have here like a description of a problem that might be quite complicated for anyone working on audio fingerprinting. So imagine a DJ mix session uh, of techno music, time scaled, mixed, several songs mixed there, recorded with a microphone in a noisy ambient. And we have to identify against a large catalog of techno music, but we still lack some tracks uh, that has been played there, and our customer wants no false positive. Well, this could be one of the situations, and this is challenging. So if some, some of you are working on audio fingerprinting, uh, this is a good challenge. Uh, also, identification of short samples of music that are played in the very, very background uh, with the speech noises on top. Uh, well, this is also problematic when they are long it's easier to identify. If they are very short and they're in the very background, it is more complicated. And also uh, false positives in audio fingerprinting is, is a challenge, especially in cases where there are, there are common sound effects between songs. So sometimes uh, two different songs are using a rain sound or laughter sounds or this kind of sound effects or even uh, music samples, the same uh, drum pattern, the same, uh, I don't know, the same synthesizer. And then if you lack content, well, you will probably find that some of these tracks that share this audio with you might be a, a true positive, but actually technically they are false, uh, a true positive, but from the business side there is a false positive and it is something that has to be taken into account. Um, about music detection, the challenges we have found in working on these technologies, in general they are common machine learning challenges, it's like how to annotate data, how much data, uh, which approach should you use, uh, is this a classification problem, a regression problem, or should you use some kind of segmentation approach which classes uh, should you use or should you annotate, uh, how to evaluate your outcome, which evaluation metrics should you use. If you just focus on accuracy, you will find many different problems. Related to these evaluation metrics, I prepare one, of, one situation that actually is, might be true, is that you might, find, you might have two different customers. One of them is super worried about false negatives because they want to find all possible music in your audio stream. And another customer is, is worried about false positives. So sometimes if you, if you don't want false negatives, maybe you will have false positives on the other side. So this is again the problem of generalization that uh, Sometimes different clients have different needs. So sometimes you need different tunings of the, of the technology for, for different customers. Um, yeah, this is here how, which evaluation, evaluation metrics should you take into account? Apart from accuracy and F measure, probably here for this customer, you have to focus a lot on music recall for the other customer, you have to focus on music precision and to be sure that you are good in, in these metrics. Uh, some generic music detection challenges re related to the service might be like 
detecting barely audible music uh, in the background. Sometimes this music is, is not even audible by humans in normal listening conditions. They need headphones with very low, uh, loud volume. So, well, sometimes for the algorithms it's, it's, it's also hard to identify this kind of music. There are many sound effects that uh, from the business perspective uh, is not music, <coughs> but they sound very similar to music. Bells, sirens, or many synthetic sound effects that are very similar to music. Some gen genres have, have might be problematic. This is not so usual, but well, in general rap, we can imagine that could be identified as background music. Uh, but in this case, uh, it's less problematic that one I, I, uh, that I had expecting at the before, at the, at the beginning. Um, some experimental music that is like sound effects. And in general, the computational time is a problem, so if you can work with small networks, it's much better. About cover identification, when some of the challenges are, well, I think the main challenge nowadays might be like scalability to large collections, because there are methods that work well in general, but uh, they typically scale linearly, so you cannot apply to millions of tracks. And there are other methods that are based on a nearest neighbor search, in general methods that are more scalable, but their accuracy, as far as, far as we know, are significantly lower than in the first case. So both things at the same time is still a challenge. And there are other research challenges related to cover identification. Um, one, could, one could be the detection of quite creative covers, let's say <coughs> going from electric to acoustic versions with many differences in the way it is sung or the instruments, like it, the structure, etc. This is still one of the, of the challenges. Not current methods not always work in these kind of cases. Um, cover identification in audio stream, in audio streams. Um, well, this is not a super challenge, but it makes harder to to make the cover identification and especially to maintain your accuracy level when you are working with Windows and you don't know the exact start and end of, of your song. Um, also, cover identification of songs without many discriminative elements. If you are uh, working with a catalog a bit larger, you might find that there are many songs that have the same chord progressions, melodies, so sometimes it's hard to, to know which one is the right song that you are trying to match. And also uh, <coughs> the, the use of degraded audio, like recorded with your phone in a noisy ambient. Well, this also degrades your accuracy and is, is one of the research challenges we can find. And uh, just to finish my presentation. I don't know if uh, my time is okay. It's okay, right? Uh, well, these are like the points I would like you to remember from this presentation. Is that at BMAT we do broadcast monitoring to achieve a fair copyright distribution. We use audio fingerprinting, music detection, and cover identification. Uh, that research at BMAT at least requires being pragmatic, uh, that the specific implementation of your algorithms and the scalability of them really matters, uh, and that we have challenges, and that if you need challenges, we can show you a few of them. <laughs> and that's all, thanks. If you have uh, any question, whatever.
Hmm. Um, yeah, none of us at the R&D team were expert on all these topics, and we have been learning with experience. Uh, but some important things is maybe really know about coding, about implementations, about, I don't know, data structures is something like you start to work on a problem and you come from the very beginning and start providing something that is, is working and can be, is reliable. Uh, and regarding the rest of technology is, um, well, you, you can see, I, I mean, you don't need to be a super expert in some of them. I mean, if we want to do this music detection, well, if you have experience on deep learning and you have done, built something before, probably you already have uh, many of the skills you need to start working with the problem. You know? And then the specific issues you will learn in with experience. So yeah, I will, I will say that this development part is very important. And if you have experience in a company before and you know how is this thing of working with legacy code, with other teams, et cetera, that is uh, totally a, a plus. Yeah. How do you balance your technology and your uh, improvements in your technology and maybe the needs of your users? Or for instance, how do you define what this is, <coughs> what is a cover? Because this might be uh, in contradiction with the needs of your clients. For instance, if you're working with channels like hip hop, uh, yeah. there is a lot of sampling, pressing. Yeah. Uh, well, in general, in the music industry, there are some rules about, I don't know the exact rules for it, about what is a cover or how, when can you consider a cover or not. These rules are very open somehow. Uh, in our case, I think uh, if you go to 98% of the cases, it's quite obvious for humans, you know? I mean, so uh, thinking of in, in 98%, maybe if you, hold, if you go to a specific genres, you're, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean, in a specific genre like hip hop, which is in the mass very popular, and, and yeah. like we, we are very strict about the cover identification. And yeah, well, I could say that in B. Matthews' case with our current cast customers, in 98% or even more, oh, in general, is, is quite obvious. Probably you might find some case in the direction you say, but we didn't find many problems about it yet. So, a, a big uh, hip hop uh, or rap or sampling based music that you use. Yeah, but sampling is more related to audio fingerprinting. And actually, uh, I mean, samples is are you reuse the whole the recording. So, this is a common case where your audio fingerprinting mm -hmm. algorithm could give a false positive, something like that. Uh, it's not very frequent. It's less frequent than I would say before working in, in this field. I don't know, maybe because samples are super uh, manipulated and then with your standard technology, they are not always uh, detected. Uh, uh, if you improve your technology, maybe you can start uh, detecting this. I mean, sometimes uh, 
if you improve your audio fingerprinting technologies, you have to improve the way to detect false positive. Uh, because they are similar, I mean, if you don't try to improve the way you know when, when it is a false positive or, no, or not, it will happen what you say. You improve your fingerprint technologies and then there will be complaints about, hey, you are detecting these short samples from this song, but this is a false positive from the business perspective. So yeah, you have to take into account this kind of aspects, but in general, in our current situation, in, it's not as problematic as I, I could say. Uh, well, as far as I know, I'm not a super expert on cover zone identification. What you can find that is more scalable uh, doesn't work as as much as, as good as, as other methods that are not scalable. And I think I would say there is no there is no method that is scalable, um, very accurate in cover zone detection yet. I don't know for for can you were doing your PhD on that topic and more or less that was uh, one of, no, uh, yeah, at the, not, yeah, the technology is not there. Yeah, so there is a challenge there. So adding to Fabio's question, so uh, so far I mean there are many organizations which manage rights, et cetera, et cetera. So and also they have different ways to work in this topic and you have ISR support on the other side. Mm -hmm. So how you manage to deal with these different bodies across different countries which have different skills in the uh, Yeah, you mean the like the organization of the catalog to be consistent, uh, to take into account? Mean, like many countries have different associations with the royalty and they work in some way even though there is some standards like ISRP, but so far I'm well ISWP is some, not some yeah, yeah. We we use cover detection internally to link ISWCs. That is like this code that is unique for our work. Yeah. We use it, uh, and we. But I will say that most of the da data is coming from the record labels, etc. So yeah, we are doing an effort to clean these codes. Uh, this is also a challenge because there are many different songs. And well, I mean, linking the ISWC of all of them sometimes is very complicated, but with cover detection is a pretty nice way to, to improve it. And sometimes with this uh, cleaning ca clean catalog, you are providing an important uh, service to your customers because otherwise there is no way to, to know which ISWC should be in this track because it, it is not ever anywhere. No? In, If, well, I mean, with this kind of information we receive with record labels, we try to deduplicate everything, and still it is a challenge there. Yeah, in, in general, with the information that comes from the record labels, you have, to, you have enough to start providing enough metadata. Okay. Okay.